All right, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to an, a pretty impressive webinar uh, from Vivid and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. It's on the predictive defect convergence functionality for HP uh, ALM. Uh, of course, as I said here, brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and that is actually me, uh, Matt Braleyberger. I'm actually a product marketing manager um, with the uh, application lifecycle management business focusing on ALM, Quality Center, and this new predictive capabilities. Fortunately, I'll only be doing a little bit of speaking here this morning. Um, Megan Sheehan is our, our senior product manager who's also with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Megan's got a pretty amazing background in data science uh, and product management, working for companies like Infragistics and Microsoft. Um, provides an awful lot of technical background, also very, very articulate. And I think there's a very, very exciting session here in general because we're talking about how we can leverage a lot of the information that a lot of organizations already have today. Just for some housekeeping, this is, of course, a live session that we are recording, and it's available for all Vivid members after the session. There will be Q&A as well. If you have any questions, I'll go through that here in just a second here. We'll have some dedicated uh, points where we can actually answer some of that information. Um, we are also looking to provide uh, a live product demonstration here as well a little bit later so you guys can see some of this functionality live. Now, in order to actually ask a question, you'll see in the webinar control panel for GoToMeeting, uh, there's an option in the questions or chat area where you can actually put your question inside. Uh, we may read out a few, we may answer a few inside, but ultimately, um, if we aren't able to get to every single question uh, today, there will be answers to the questions in a document that will be posted on the Vivid site with this presentation fairly shortly afterwards. Uh -huh. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead here and we'll get things started. Um, so again, my name is Matt Braleyberger, uh, Product Marketing Manager with Hewlett Packard. We're going to talk about some brand new functionality that is actually available in, in small portion uh, yeah. currently. So, oh, somebody needs to go on mute there. Yeah, yeah um, Matt, were you hearing that too? Okay, I thought it was I just was. my imagination. Okay. No, no, that's, that's all right. So I guess yeah, one of one of our uh, one of our technical assistants may need to uh, provide mute for themselves here. Um, now this is interesting because if you've got ALM and Quality Center. Um, and you've been using it for a while, a lot of the, the, the data that you've got stored within your system provides an awful lot of uh, potential for insight. And actually, this is what we're looking to do with some of uh, the pieces that are already available currently. And there'll be an awful lot more that Megan will talk about coming up uh, in the future, uh, likely, where we're trying to go with some of this functionality. Um, so predictive defect convergence is the first piece that is available right now. And I guess I'll start off by just reminding everybody on the session um, just a, a, a private session here with just a few hundred of our friends. Um, of our closest of the, friends, yes. Of our closest <laughs> friends, exactly. So this is a forward-looking statement. Some of the stuff could change within the functionality um, and some of the things that we're looking to deliver. This is the normal stuff that we talk about um, with anything that may be upcoming. Um, again, a lot of this stuff is available today, and that's what we'll talk about first. But there's a longer-term vision that we've got behind the technology and some of the functionality that we're providing here. So just that reminder that some of the stuff is subject to change, and as we all know in the software industry, probably will change as we begin to uh, roll this out to some of our customers and as we get additional feedback. And Matt, I'm going to go even stronger on that. I would say yeah. yes, yes, things will change as we build more, more algorithms and as we learn from it, absolutely. Things are going to change. What we're sharing today is our, our most current knowledge on our plans and you know our best estimates, but expect that absolutely in the next three years there will be changes. And it's very analogous to the whole idea of the, the uh, predictive learning and the, the computer-aided learning algorithms where we have stuff always being constantly reassessed and adjusted and all this, things like that. So it's all part of the fun here. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll start off here by talking about uh, why big data matters in ALM. Um, again, for, not everybody has the same background, of course, on these sessions, and so I'll just take a few brief moments to talk about, well, what do you mean, what, what is big data within the context of what we're talking about? Um, what are some of the things that we may be able to do with some of the ALM data that we've got in our technology already today? Um, and I'll talk about just some of the very high-level concept stuff. Megan will get into sort of the lower depths of what predictive defect convergence is. Um, again, this is available currently today. Um, you can get that on the HP Live Network, and we'll talk a bit more about that at the end. Megan will also go through a demonstration, and we'll talk about some of the, the feedback and things that we're looking to get through the process because, again, this is an iterative cycle um, as we begin to release some of this functionality to the customers and to the various uh, test environments. Of course, we're adjusting some of these algorithms um, as we go ahead. So 
why does big data matter uh, in ALM? And I thought this was very interesting. I read an article in Forbes that talked about really big data represents a fundamental shift in how we do things. Um, it opens the door to this thing called a Bayesian approach to strategy, where we no longer try to be right based on controlled research and small samples, but become less wrong over time. And the concept is, yeah, Bayesian strategy is I, I, for all intents and purposes, set a goalpost and I begin to look at an algorithm or create some sort of a strategy to get to some sort of an end mean. And as I get new data, I then adjust my algorithm and, and keep shifting and moving so I can actually get some sort of an approach or a strategy that really does represent something that's the success. Now, one might argue if this is a science, we should be able to do things arithmetically or be able to look at large quantities of data and make sense of them. The challenge is in some large systems like software um, and certainly like team-based things where we've got people involved in the process, people always add an additional element of complexity. There may be just a, such a large quantity of variables and interdependencies that it's just difficult to, to algorithmically pull things out. Even though there may be logical connections, just the quantity of things become so hard and, and so challenging for organizations. And so again, this is the approach of, let's put some sort of a goalpost out there. Um, let's find some sort of an algorithm that provides some sort of a meaningful result. And as we get new data and run certain trials, let's adjust that algorithm over time. And I'm not, it's not quite trial and error because it's certainly a little bit more scientific than that. But the idea is we're trying to get through adjustment to an algorithm or some sort of a, a repeatable process um, where we're able to get what we call the right answer. Now, big data is one of those terms in software and in, in the industry that gets overused often. It's one of those buzzwords if you're playing buzzword bingo. Um, but I mean, you're already seeing, if you've got a cell phone and you're within the United States or Canada or even Europe, you're already seeing big, big, big uses of big data um, in your environment. People are taking the things that you're doing. They're beginning to add uh, algorithms and, and applied uh, computing technologies to try and understand certain pieces of information that we can maybe use for marketing, for medical research, for environmental sciences, all sorts of things like that. Um, if you're using Android, for example, Google does a fantastic job um, of actually taking things like your locations and your buying preferences and when you're on your phone and not, and beginning to build uh, profiles of the individuals that we can then predict future behavior. Um, and of course, the prediction is what we're all trying to go towards um, when we're talking about using big data and some of these algorithms. Um, but the key is that this is already stuff that's in use today in different domains. What we're talking about doing is taking some of the stuff that's already in uh, the ALM product, lots of different uh, fields and, and histories and transitions of data and what users are doing, and begin to construct future predictions um, based on your past uh, insight. And it's interesting because the larger your data set, the more accurate these results end up being. And so when I've talked to organizations in the past, and we've got fortunate to have a lot of very large customers using ALM out there. A lot of the conversation gets down to, you know, the data source just becomes so large. Our database gets big over time. Well, yes. Um, and rather than necessarily archiving or putting that away or heaven forbid, deleting it, um, this stuff actually provides incredible value to the team as a whole. And so this is using really, I've got an, uh, sort of a, a diagram on the right there that's really talking about our process. This is where we've got data and metadata that's actually pulled into our, our data science bucket, as I'm calling it here in my funnel, where we actually apply computational science in this concept of machine learning. And machine learning is effectively the ability for um, an algorithm to adjust itself based on looking at its predictions and then the actual end result and then tweak and then run the set again until we get something that's an awful lot closer to where we need to be. Uh, but this is again something that's already in use in a lot of different models. What we're doing is transcribing a lot of that or, or maybe even better, we're, we're mutating some of that concept that may be used in something like marketing and then trying to apply it to things like software development and structured team technologies and stuff like that. But again, starts with theoretical model and then how that model is applied and we observe the data over time. Um, the key is that this is refined. And I remember when we talked about some of the early phases and in, 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 uh, iterations of the predictive pieces, gosh, even last year, um, we had sample data with customers and we were always adjusting the algorithm. It was adjust and then look again, because you'd look at the past history and if we could predict something that was accurate based on what past history actually showed, we'd have something that may work, but then you'd have to go to a different customer, look at their data and then adjust over time and so forth. So there's a lot of different recommendations we've got about how you use ALM properly, and Megan will talk about that a little bit later here. 
um, and what fields and, and you know, values you should maybe be looking to, to categorize in order to make this most valuable to you and the team. But again, the key is what we're using is an algorithm. We're using technology to actually drive some sort of a business uh, outcome from what we see in the past potentially as large qualities of, quantities of data. Now, if we step back for a minute, this is very interesting, and, and I would argue an incredible leap forward when we look at application lifecycle management or the whole concept of just software development. A lot of technologies push their capability and very, very you know, aptly beat their chest about how well we can predict, or sorry, how we can report on stuff that's done in the past. Very few talk about the concept of prediction. Um, you know, it, it, ALM and Quality Center are very well known, fortunately, again, through our involvement in our customer community in being able to report on information uh, that we've seen in the past. And we can make suppositions, and a lot of smart managers and team members will be able to guess intelligently sometimes what we believe future behavior is going to be, but we're not often very correct within a certain reasonable margin. What we're talking about now is the ability to take that data and to predict the future. Um, and again, I'll, I'll let Megan talk more about the details here shortly, but it's, it's all the way from if you think about your data being in ALM related to defects and then tests, um, and then you've got requirement information. And what if we're using the ALI capabilities and connecting it to development? There's a whole host of things that we suddenly be, become able to do if we can throw the right algorithm against the right quantity of data. Um, now, again, in big data, this is very important to us, and this is very important as we're going through our own development of our um, functionality here. Focusing on the right questions is really that critical first step um, because if we don't know what we're trying to get, not the right answer necessarily, but sometimes maybe it is the right answer, but it's, it's a focus on what we're ultimately trying to achieve. It's very difficult when you put anything um, that moves as quickly as some of these self-learning algorithms against a data source if we're not clear on the outcome. The, the, the analogy I may use is if you had a really nice sports car, a nice Ferrari or something like that, and if you didn't know where you're going and you just press the pedal, it's going to go wherever the car feels like going. But if I've actually got a driver behind the wheel and can orient that, I've actually got a very powerful machine that's at my control, and I can actually get some fairly impressive things done with it. Now, of course, Ferrari is very expensive, and I would never own one, but God, they're really nice vehicles. So the other question is always, how big is big? And again, Megan will have some, some recommendations, and we'll have some more information we'll talk about in this session, but also in some follow-on documentation about how much data you likely need within your system in order to be able to get real value out of this. And that's always the statistical analysis uh, quandary is you know, what is the right set of data to be able to draw meaningful conclusions from? And so is it a year's worth of data? Is it thousands of records? Is it hundreds of thousands of records? And as you might expect, the answer is always it depends. So again, some of the ALM data that we've already got today here, there's a lot of stuff we've got to work with, requirements, test plans, test runs, defects. And again, the larger the site we're finding, um, the more insightful some of the predictions can ultimately be. But it doesn't mean if you you only have a year or so of project data underneath it that it, you can't get use out of it. Of course you can. It's just you get varying degrees of, of, call them correctness, on the predictions as you get larger and larger quantities of data and as you're doing larger things. And again, I sort of threw this out earlier because I think it'll be the common theme as we go through this. The question we got even last year as we started going through the early phases of developing this was, well, what do I need in my ALM or quality center system to actually make this work? And so fortunately, Megan's put together an amazing white paper that she'll talk about a little bit later that talks about exactly that. So what I'll do at this point here is I'll pass things over to uh, Megan, and Megan will do most of the talking now and talk about predictive and some of the other pieces here. So Megan, I'm going to let you continue from here. Okay, thanks, Matt. I'm trying to share now. <clears throat> let me know when you can see it. You are good to go. Yep, looks good. Okay, here, let's put this back into projection mode. Okay, great, thanks. Matt, thanks for the intro. Thanks for the summary. Um, I felt you were on a roll. I thought you could just keep going, but anyway, <laughs> let me jump in. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. As I'm sure you've noticed, Matt and I are really excited about this. Um, we're biased, but we think this is one of the coolest things that not only ADM, but HPE are doing. And so we're so happy to be able to share this with you. Um, and before I start talking specifically about predictive ALM, which is going to be the bulk of our, our webinar, I do want to mention that 
all of the things that we are talking about with this go hand in hand with next gen ALM. So all of the improvements, the changes that we're making there, and Matt, maybe you know a little bit more about our upcoming plans for webinars or other information on next gen ALM, but for anybody in our audience who, who hasn't heard about it already, I would strongly recommend that you do um, attend some of those sessions to find out because we're really excited about that too. There's a lot of goodness being added to it and, uh, and it will absolutely improve ALM, but it also sets us up for predictive ALM too. So Matt, I'll, I'll now let you answer the question I asked you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So actually we're looking to try and get a webinar together in about the March time frame, probably early March, just to talk about this. So again, the, for anybody who's got ALM today, we're not talking about making you buy a new product. This is just the next no, iteration exactly. of what yes. ALM will become. And so we are, we, because there is some new stuff that we're adding to it and changing some of the uh, usability, I'd argue, for the significant betterment, um, we want to have some sort of a webinar. And so stay tuned. It'll likely, very likely be a vivid webinar coming up in March. Right, right. And the good point, Matt, this is not uh, a new uh, new license. Like this would be available to our customers under the licenses that they have now for ALM. Um, yeah. But anyway, more information about that will be coming. Um, I want to mention that in addition to the UI changes, the architecture beneath it, it to, I, and I think I'm biased, but that's what I'm most excited about because we will be building in more data integrations, more synchronization, so that we're able to pull more information into ALM and I keep thinking of it really as the hub where you can look and see what's happening across your life cycle and then you know from the predictive perspective that enables us to create algorithms that right now aren't possible because we don't have any way to combine these different data sources. And so with that, you know, let me start on predictive. And as Matt mentioned, like the whole idea behind this is that we can leverage data you already have, that you, you may not even be thinking about it in this way. All of your existing ALM projects and within that the requirements, the defects, the test runs, and all of the metadata associated with that. Every time you run a test, there's a metadata that's that's collected too. And for most people, it's it's just kind of sitting there as dark data. It's unanalyzed. And what we are doing with our algorithms is figuring out how can we unlock the insights that this provides. And we initially started down this journey in large part to solve some of our own problems. And then when we realized that, wow, hey, some of the calculations that we're coming up with um, have not only strong predictive capabilities, good goodness of fit measures, but are really useful useful, we also thought, hey, many of our customers have the same headaches that we do. And so we are now in the process of productizing these algorithms that we've built. And, you know, we're using some pretty standard techniques in terms of machine learning, pattern matching algorithms, cluster analysis, and you know a lot of these techniques have been around for a long time. Uh, what's, what's new and most exciting now is that with the processing power that's available today and with the, the large data repositories that we have, we can now mine information in ways that just wasn't possible previously. And so uh, we are doing all of this with the goal of providing actionable insights and recommendations. And so Matt was talking about prediction. Absolutely, that's a big piece of it. But we're taking it a step further even. And instead of just saying, here's what's going to happen, we're also looking for ways that we can make recommend recommendations. So it becomes more prescriptive guidance. Just telling you that something bad is going to happen is not enough. We want to be able to say, here are the things that you can do too mitigate your risk, to optimize your outcomes, to, to hit your specified dates. It, it really depends on what the, the algorithm is looking at, what the use case is, the type of recommendations that we'd be offering. But we really want to make this actionable. That's the goal. It's not just data analysis for analysis sake. You know, there are a few of us who just 
love that and that's enough. I'm guilty of being one of them, but you know, for most people, and here's where the product really becomes so much more valuable, is how can we help you improve your processes and optimize your outcomes? That's, that's really the goal with this. Okay, let's see, and here we go. Okay, now, the, I, I feel the need again to issue the disclaimer that you know we're talking about a rolling three-year roadmap, and what I'm showing you here with the framework is our longer-term vision for this product. Not all of these capabilities will be available in the first release of Predictive ALM, but we wanted to give you a sense of where we're going, the journey that we're on. And we're looking across the whole software development life cycle. And again, here is where all of those data integrations in NextGen ALM become so important. And with many of the things that we're looking at, you know, it's absolutely possible today to do them, but it's much easier on Next-Gen ALM when we have all of, uh, more of the integrations built kind of inbox, sort of by default, uh, so it's, it's easier. Okay, now, um, you can see that we're mapping this to planning, development, testing, and operations. You can think of that as production. I'd like to start talking about the testing because this is actually where we are beginning our development and the um, technology preview that we're going to be demoing in a minute is focused on the defect uh, convergence. We are starting with this very intentionally for a couple of reasons. One, we know that many of our customers have a great deal of data associated with testing in ALM. So we want to lead with our strengths and go with the areas where today you know, we can show value by helping you analyze what you've already got. That you're not looking at waiting you know, 18 months, two years, or, or whatever your time frame is to adopt more tools, but you know, we can show you value today. And there's a great deal of data in ALM associated with testing. And so some of the things that we could be looking at, um, and you know, I'll even go so far as to say these are some of the things that we're looking at now, um, are in terms of accelerating the detection and the, the fixing of defects. That's really what we want to accomplish, is helping people get more efficient and more accurate in these areas. So looking at defect injection rates, fix rates, um, perhaps even being able to identify early on in the cycle which defects, while you're still in development, would be likely to cause escalations in production or cause problems in production. Um, Reuse of tests, that is a very frequent request that I get from customers. Uh, being able to, another one that's not appears anomaly detection, being able to identify tests that are problematic. Now, we're also looking at the development and the production side kind of simultaneously. When you think about the coupling testing data with operation or production data, to me that's a huge leap in delivering on DevOps solutions that I think that many people right now are existing and, and challenged by organizations that are very siloed and our data tends to be siloed as well. We have started looking at combining production data with our test data. Um, I don't think we'll have time for it today, Matt, but that might be an interesting future webinar uh, to demo that capability where we can compare what people are actually doing in production to what tests are covering and then identify the gaps, which if you're not testing testing for something at all, that represents a large potential risk. You don't know exactly what could go wrong if you aren't aware that people are doing it. And so making recommendations about what you need to do to either change tests or create tests to get better production coverage, um, we think that absolutely would provide a lot of tactical value. And then um, with the, the development phase, I don't want to give away too much of the next-gen ALM uh, roadmap, but we would We'll have source code repositories uh, in NextGen, and I think that that opens up many very interesting use cases when we can start analyzing the source code and the metadata associated with the source code 
in combination with the ALM data that we have around requirements, around tests, around defects. And you know, I, I think that opens up a lot of insight that, again, right now is not possible because all of this data and these groups are existing in silos. And then as a product manager, I'm very excited about a lot of the planning capabilities. Uh, you'll see some of those in um, AGM already, our Agile Manager tool, they've made a lot of investments in improving the planning process. And I know from personal experience, and you know this has been uh, challenging for me throughout my career, that if you start with estimates that are inaccurate, that everything cascading off of that is also going to be inaccurate. And so you're looking at then cutting features or changing dates, and it, it creates more headaches down the line. So I personally am very excited to see us improve our own planning process by using these and then being able to share it with customers too. So Matt, are there any questions? I think you're watching the questions while I'm talking. Any questions I should be aware of or you want to address right now? Or any points that you think I've missed that we, we want to be sure to, to uh, share? Well, there's a lot of questions just around the algorithm about you know whether we're able to tune the algorithm or exclude variables to adapt, things like that. Okay, um, like about one of them specifically or about the uh, defect convergence? My guess is, uh, is actually anything. So what's currently okay, available now, whether we can tune that or whether in future we're going to provide that tuning ability to the customers. Okay, that's a great question. And so let me explain a little bit more about that. Um, each and every use case that we're talking about is really a, a separate algorithm. Now, there may be pieces that we'll be able to reuse. That's something that we're, we're looking for over time so that we can accelerate our own development. And we're absolutely learning from every algorithm that we develop. And before we even share it with customers, like we are now in the technology preview, um, for the the defect convergence one specifically, let's talk about that. We've been working on that one for about a year, and we started it uh, with several of our own very large data sets. We had to tweak it to refine it um, until it had good predictive capabilities, and then we started validating it with customer data. And I think we had, uh, if I remember correctly, and Shell, you can come off mute if I'm wrong, around 10, 10 large uh, customer projects that we then used to, again, tune it, to tweak it, to improve the capabilities. And we got it to the point where we we're seeing between a 40 to 50 percent increase in accuracy with our algorithm versus a naive algorithm where you'd just be looking at a mean or other measures of central tendency in terms of how long it would take for a defect to converge. And so this adds definite value. It's a much stronger, uh, more accurate predictor. And what we're doing now with the tech preview is sharing it with customers. Um, and I'll talk more about how to get it in a minute. Um, and then we're looking for feedback on that because we want to continue to improve it. And so uh, I think that, as Matt said, with all of this, with the algorithm development, it's, it's really a process of continuous improvement. Um, and as more data is introduced, as things change over time, then um, you know, it, it will continue to improve. Um, and then in terms of customers being able to do kind of their own tweaking, it, the algorithm is run on your data. And so it really depends on, in large part, the quality and the consistency of the data you have. Are people using the tool consistently? Are they updating the status in a timely manner? Are they using the severity levels to mean the same thing? So the more homogeneous, the more consistent your data is within a project, across projects, um, the better the the predictive capabilities the algorithm is going to have. If there's a lot of variation from team to team, from project to project, then it is, it's much more difficult to get accurate predictions because it's sort of the, the garbage in, garbage out principle. Um, and so that's really the focus of the white paper, which is available as a handout in the webinar, is about offering guidance right now, today, about what you could do with your ALM projects to get them ready, not just for the predictive defect convergence algorithm, but for the other ones that are on our roadmap and you'll be hearing more about in the coming months and years you know, as we release them as tech previews and then as um, GA versions. Okay.
any other questions you think we should address now, Matt? Nothing right now. I know a lot of people are just saying, we want to see the demo. <laughs> okay, yes, that's the most exciting part. I want to get to that, too. <laughs> and sorry if I got really loud. You can hear my excitement. <laughs> okay, can you see what I'm sharing now, Matt? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, great. So I am so excited, and I have to give a shout out to Shal and Iran, my awesome R&D folks, um, who got this demo up and running. This is actually running on ALM. Uh, we can support versions 11.52 for QC and ALM. 11.52 and newer with this. Uh, the tech preview is available as an add-in to ALM. That's how we have it running here. There's also a SaaS version that's available. I think we have uh, one of our upcoming slides has all that information and it will also be included in the email that goes out. So you can see I'm looking at the defects module here. Um, this is, again, standard ALM. I'm now going to look at the filters that we have. And you can use any of the filters that are, are available in ALM. And I have to say, I've had a lot of fun kind of playing with this and looking at applying different filters and different subsets of defects. You can actually get it down to the developer level and see, you know, for example, how long it would take one person to fix the defects assigned to them. Um, for this demo, we're going to look at the critical critical or high defects and a new status. So I'm going to apply that uh, filter and we're looking at a subset of our defects now. I'm going to click on this little prediction uh, button that looks like a uh, uh, column chart <laughs> and it's going to calculate it's running the algorithm in the background on our data, on this subset of data. And again, I can look at any subset. I can filter down to a specific team. I can look at just critical bugs, uh, defects, you know, any way you want to look at it. And I encourage people to try it out, to play with it. The default is a 95% confidence interval, but you can change that. If you're okay with more uncertainty, you can kind of get into some what-if analysis. So you can think of the confidence interval as, what are my chances, what are my odds? of closing all of these defects by a specific date. And so here's this listing of the subset of defects that we're talking about. If I click on this button, I see a cumulative area chart, and I can see you know, the confidence level is over here and then the projected date in the future. And so I can watch what happens if I change this. If I want to say, right, with 99% certainty, then uh, it goes to March 4th. If I want to say, all right, what happens if I'm 80% confident? February 27th, I can also look at changing the number of developers. So what happens if I put 10 developers on this? How would my dates change? So again, we're enabling some what-if analysis. Um, and you do reach a point where adding more developers really doesn't help you reach a closer date, much like in real life. Throwing more people at a problem does not always accelerate your development, or it only does up into a certain point. Um, the other way that I can look at it is, all right, if I've got a certain date in the future that I need to hit, uh, what are my chances of getting there? So if I were to click you know, um, January 28th, I've got really zero, zero chance of closing all of these defects by then. Okay, February 11th, if I want to be aggressive, I can say, all right, I've got a 78% chance of closing the subset of defects that I looked at um, by February 11th with 10 developers. And so, again, I can change these parameters and see what happens with the estimates. And I'm so excited that this is available today uh, for everyone to try out. So, Matt, anything you want to add about this or any questions that we want to address? No, I think so far so good. I mean, I always like seeing it as well because I think it's just a very slick user interface. So, nope, so far so good. I, I like it too. You know I'm a sucker for data visualization. I love the charts, love the clean lines. Uh, and it's it, I'm so happy that the demo is working and that I'm actually able to show it live. I think it makes it more real than you know showing a video. Absolutely. Yep, I agree with that 100%. Okay, so should, let's go back to our slides. And uh, here we want to show, where are we? Show the demo. Okay, so. Um, here. Oh, I probably, maybe I should have talked about this one uh, first. So, 
maybe not. I think I talked talked through these things as I was showing the demo. Um, so we, as I said, you know, this has stronger predictive capabilities than a naive algorithm, and we're really interested in feedback from our customers on what they're seeing when they run this on their own data. Um, we know from our own development experience that we tend to use our tools differently than customers, and we want this to be as accurate as possible. So we are soliciting input from people so that we can improve it over time. Okay, and so how can you get it? Um, and Terry, I believe these links will be available in the email that we're sending out too. This PowerPoint deck will also be available. Um, the bits are posted on HP Live Network. As I said in the demo, it's a... Sorry, is somebody trying to say something? No, it may just be background noise. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so available for QC or ALM, 11.52, 12.02, 12.5. It will work as a simple add-in for any of those. We tried to make this as easy as possible for customers to get. And, you know, we love our customers, and we are excited to share this with you. We want to show you the direction that we're going in. And, you know, we think that this is actually, you know, a handy algorithm. It's very useful, so we're excited to get it out there. Um, we've provided a user guide. The, all the instructions are available on how to, um, how to install it. And <clears throat> the white paper is also posted up there. Um, it's available as the handout in the webinar, too. I, suggest, you know, please take a look at it. I tried to make it understandable for anybody who doesn't get excited about data science, so I hope that it accomplishes that. And then for SaaS customers, it's actually even easier. Um, all you need to do is email predictivealm at hpe.com, request the predictive defect convergence algorithm, and we can turn it on on our end. Matt, are there any questions? Uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, I don't know if we want to grab a few of them now or, well, I'll, yeah, let's get the white paper. We'll talk about the white paper and then we'll go through because there are quite a few questions. I'm glad we left enough time for them. Okay, great. And I'm in projection mode, so I can't actually see any of the questions. I can uh, get out of that if you want me to. So, right, no, the white good. paper. As I said, and Matt, you know, feel free to jump in on anything else with the white paper, too. Um, do we, I, I kept getting questions from customers about what should I do, you know, how do we do this? And so I wrote this white paper, um, again, like trying to make it accessible and, and really clear about here are the very specific things that we recommend that you do. Um, I put in kind of the, the best case scenario, here's what we are recommending everything. Even if you only do some of those, it's still going to be a benefit uh, when you start using the predictive analytics. Um, I tried to make it clear, and most of the things that I've highlighted really are just best practices. So you don't even have to wait for predictive ALM to reap the benefits of doing these. You'll see some benefits right away, like being able to look at things across projects, getting your teams to use things um, more consistently. So I tried to make it you know, as clear and, uh, and easy to use as possible. And Matt was my test reader, and he kept saying, no, this is too complex. No, back to the drawing board. He was a real taskmaster. That's true. That's true. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my technical chops over time here. So as I'm getting into the details, I'll be like, Megan, Megan, this is too complex. Help me, help me figure this out. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Megan, say that in English instead. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so Matt, do you want to uh, throw some questions out there? Yep, let's do that here. So uh, the first question that came up actually was uh, a number of customers are segmenting their ALM projects by domain. Um, are we going to be able to do predictive capabilities across domains or across projects? Uh, across projects, absolutely. Across domains, good question. From a technical perspective, yeah, there's no reason why we wouldn't. Um, I think it would just have to be specified when you're configuring the predictive ALM. Like, this is going to be a separate product. Um, right now, we're, we're sharing the algorithm that we're talking about today, but eventually this will be a product that is closely coupled with ALM, but not part of ALM. So I think when you're configuring that, you would just need to specify uh, where you'd want to pull the data from. 
Right. And again, it's, it's maybe worth reiterating. So this is the first piece. It's a bit of a teaser for everybody, but ultimately there's going to be additional functional areas that we'll be looking at releasing over the next likely year or years, uh, depending on how much stuff we want to keep growing the suite with. Well, you know, I think, and this is my opinion, um, I think that once we start putting the algorithms out there that we've identified, and this is a good point for me to, to mention too, you know, you may be wondering, well, how did we prioritize these? How did we identify them? Um, we did some really large market research studies um, to identify what are the biggest pain points, what are the biggest headaches that people have today across the software development life cycle. We cast a broad net. Um, we interviewed about 700 people, not just our customers, but you know, kind of everybody who's out there, broad sample. Um, from the planning through development, testing, and production to be able to quantify and prioritize what are the, the biggest problems. And that's what we are using to prioritize our own backlog for the algorithms because we want to focus on the things that are causing people the most pain and where we think we can add the most value. And so I suspect that once we start working down that list, we're going to uncover other things. And I see this as a, a longer journey that we've identified the ones we want to start with, but as we get feedback from customers, as new tools are introduced, as new challenges arise, there's an opportunity for us to address those with algorithms too. And, you know, I, I think with data science, I think part of it is art. And anytime we're making the predictions, it, it's never 100% accuracy, but what we can do is reduce uncertainty. And even if we can reduce the uncertainty by, by 50, by 80%, that's a big improvement over where we are today. Uh, actually, that's a huge point. You're right. In a lot of cases, we're not looking for the answer is seven, but we're looking to say, well, where is where's the likely area I should be focusing in on? Is it a certain number of defects? Is it a user? Is it my, you know, part of my architecture? That kind of stuff. Right. And so you're right. Instead of saying the answer is seven, it may be the answer is between six and eight. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's actually a good way of putting it. Okay, so let's see here. So um, are there going to be different, I guess one of the questions was, will there be multiple algorithms to select from or will it be just an algorithm for an area and then we can maybe tune that algorithm if we need to? Uh, there probably will be well, they're going to have to be different algorithms because they're they're very specific to specific use cases. It's not like there's just one general purpose algorithm that we could use for everything. Um, and I'm envisioning it as really being kind of different modules, like where are you looking across the life cycle? What is the challenge that you're looking at? And then, you know, we will be adding to the product over time with new algorithms and you saw the framework, you see the vision of where we're going and we will continue to innovate and add to those over time. That makes sense. Um, so one of the questions, and you might have expected this kind of a question, um, are you able to name some of the machine lear learning algorithms um, that we've tried and, and what have we found useful in maybe other contexts? Um, I, I'm wondering, did that question come from Ohad, our data scientist? Is he trying no, to? No, it, it, believe it or not, it didn't. <laughs> okay, I'm just teasing. Um, so there are uh, several, and I, some of this is our IP, so I don't want to give too much away. Um, decision trees, forests, um, cluster analysis, uh, the, the HPE labs are doing some interesting things with an kind of an iterative cluster analysis approach. So um, there are some standard techniques that anybody can you know, read about in academic journals or, or books. And then we have some like really, really smart data scientists um, who are working internally and then they've developed some additional things. Uh, am I being specific yet vague enough, Matt? <laughs> no, I think that's good. And I think you, I mean, you hit on a very important point earlier, which is yeah, this isn't going to be a solution that we'll drop a version one of. It is going to evolve over time. And if you think about the industry as a whole, the software industry is also adjusting. I think you made this point, Megan, earlier that you know, in a year from now, the software industry may be way into something like a DevOps world, or we may be thinking far more into the agile world, or maybe neither. And so we wanted to create an architecture and a, and a system and a framework that we could evolve and deal with the challenges, you know, as things work over time, not just say, here's your tool, here's your algorithm, go enjoy yourself, because that, the world isn't static like that, and we know that. I wish it was right. sometimes, but it's right, not. Right. And, you know, I also want to say, Matt, you bring up a really good point, that I believe that all of our customers are going to be hearing more about 
predictive analytics, predictive and, and prescriptive capabilities, big data analysis, really across the HPE portfolio. Yep. Um, and as you know, Matt and I have a, a virtual team of different product managers, um, developers, etc. really around HP software and some hardware folks and big data. Um, we're, we get to share best practices, learning, and there's so much excitement around this. And so many people kind of see the, the internal assets that we have, Vertica, Autonomy, and then a lot of the things coming out of HPE Labs that are, are really innovative. And so I expect, and this is my opinion, that you're going to hear more about that really across our portfolio, that other people are seeing the same opportunities that we are in terms of analyzing dark data and helping customers really make more informed decisions and, and more informed trade-offs or mitigating risk. You know, the security folks are doing a lot of exciting stuff too. So, you know, that's my, I guess, my plug for all of HPE. <laughs> so that makes sense. Now, now, do we have, I guess, one of the questions I thought was interesting, this came up, actually, I had the same question myself last year. When we're talking about defect prediction, are we looking at anything like uh, maybe predicting the chance that specific test cases will find defects? Oh, okay. So that's that's slightly different than what we're talking about with the predictive defect convergence. Um, that actually is on our radar and something that our data scientists are investigating now. Um, I think that there's a, a whole lot that we can do with defects and with tests and with all of the ALM data that we have, that customers have. So um, I'll give kind of, a, I guess, a preview of coming attractions that over the next several months, um, we're going to be talking a lot more about that. Okay, so another question here, which I think is again an excellent question: um, Are there any limitations to the number of defects, or on the number of defects, which can be used for the actual prediction? So, for example, if a project has only a handful of defects, maybe ten or twenty, uh, does prediction still work, or do we need a larger set of data? Oh, that's another great question. And Shal, maybe you want to come off mute. Um, because I'm trying to remember the specifics. Um, I think we have this in the user guide, but I could be wrong. Um, I want to say we're looking at around 3,000 defects in order to have strong goodness of fit measures. If you've got fewer than that or more, you know, it, it is possible, but that's kind of the minimum that we're looking at, if I remember correctly. And then uh, it, I, in terms of... Oh, hi, Oh, good. Shaul. I'm hi, everyone. Am I remembering yeah. correctly, or is it a different I think number? it's actually slightly, obviously, it varies from project to project, depends on various sure. factors, but, but generally speaking, I think we need a few hundred defects to get ah. decent results. Obviously, okay. as with any predictive algorithm, the more accurate, the, 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 the higher the number of, uh, you know, tr uh, training data that, that exists, the more accurate the algorithm will be, but I think we get a decent accuracy from a few hundred defects, which have completed their life cycle, as in, mm -hmm. if, unless it, you know, we know how long it took to fix, then we can't, uh, we can't learn for future defects. So a few hundred defects which have been fixed already. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. And I'm glad that it's a lower number. I think I was remembering the size of the projects we were looking at to analyze for um, tuning the algorithm before we even shared it in the tech preview. So thank you. And the, the duration that you would need, it really varies greatly by team, by project. For some groups, um, getting 500 defects would be a matter of weeks. For others, it's longer. You know, it really depends on, on how long it would take and how many people you have working on it, really the size of the project. So thank so, you, Shaw. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So I've got a couple of other, um, maybe there are, well, there are deployment-related questions here. So the first one is, uh, which versions, again, are we supporting with this? Oh, sure. This here, let me go back version. to that. Yep. Um, QC or ALM, 11.52, 12.02, or 12.5. Now, is 12.21 supported within there as well? Because it was sort of a minor release. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was as well because 12.2.1 shares the same data model as 12.5 effectively. Right. So 12.2.1 should also be supported. Yeah. Um, the other question, I know we talked about this, but worth reiterating, um, predictive ALM isn't using a new database. You're actually, we're actually using your existing ALM database that you've already got, right? Right. So that definitely makes it a lot easier. You're not having to reinstall or, or re-correlate data. You've actually got a lot of what you need to get going out of the box. Um, as you start working with this stuff that you've already been uh, using in ALM today. Um, will partners be able to create and use their own algorithms? Will partners be able to create and use their own algorithms? Oh, you mean for the predictive defect convergence or like in the product eventually? 
I think eventually in the larger scope of things. Okay. Um, d yes, I, I think so. Um, we have not gotten that far yet in terms of you know how we would architect it, and we could eventually, eventually, not not right now, uh, because we're still building so many of these algorithms, but longer term, I think we would consider exposing some APIs. Um, but there is, again, there's probably going to be either use cases, challenges that are very customer specific that are not things that we would build into the product. So I think that, you know, in any any domain, you'd be looking at some algorithms that would be more targeted to just certain customers, and then you know I would recommend that you know, partners uh, or customers themselves, if they've got their own data scientists or teams to do this, that they would be looking at building those specifically themselves, that that's not something we would put into predictive ALM. We're trying to um, focus on you know broad market needs. Which makes sense. All right, so a couple couple tougher questions here, just to, to prove that we're not completely seeding the, the pond here with easy questions for us, which would just be great. But so uh, the tougher one here is, uh, so when we did the demonstration, or you did that a little earlier, uh, we're, does our algorithm assume that the number of developers are working only on fixing defects and really nothing else? No, it's really based on the number of developers that you've had working on it previously. So we're kind of assuming in the algorithm that uh, whatever happened in the past is is really what we're using to calculate the, the future, the prediction. And so let's just say, for example, that you had uh, five developers who were spending 30% of their time and it took them you know, X number of days to fix these defects. That's what gets built into the model. It's whatever happened in the past in your project. So and that's why Shal pointed out that it's important to have uh, a, uh, a repository, a, a history of defects that have gone through the whole life cycle so we could see what actually happened. Now, I also want to point out that just this is a general kind of data science principle that points that are closer in time are more closely correlated. So more recent projects where you had the, potentially the same people working on it or the same uh, type of development, that's going to be more closely correlated with what would happen in the future. So it would give you better predictive capabilities versus something that happened five years ago. Right, and it, which makes sense because, again, the world changes so quickly. Right. Um, okay, so a much tougher question, and uh, I'm sure you've got a good answer for this because I, I, we've talked about this in the past. Um, don't the results ultimately depend on the correctness and the consistency of the data? And you know, does the tool help to clean up any data structures, or are we just leveraging what's already in it? Uh, so absolutely, that is the main point that I tried to make when talking about the white paper. Absolutely depends on the quality of the data that you have. For our tools, no, we're not with the, this algorithm, nor do I envision us cleaning up existing data as part of predictive ALM. Um, the, because again, that tends to be more um, like project or team or, or company specific, how you would need to do conversions or other things. The, the best practice recommendation that I can make, and I'll, I'll say it again because I think this is really important, is to make sure that people are using the tool consistently and accurately. Like if a defect is open and it stays in new status until it is closed, then that really doesn't help us figure out exactly how long it took to fix or whether things were reopened or reassigned, etc. So you want to make sure that people are, are using the tool consistently and in the way that you intend. Whatever you know, best practices you want to use, but you know, ensuring that people are using it that way. And that's what the white paper talks a bit about too. Excellent. Okay, so again, we talked about this before, and I'm always interested in, in, in maybe hearing this or some of the folks here would. Um, could this actually work with data that we've imported into ALM from a competitor tool? Yes. Yeah, from a technical perspective, yes. Could it be, yeah, how again, much it's, transformation would need to happen? Um, that might depend on what the data is. So I, I'm going to issue a general yes, it's possible. Um, getting into the specifics, we'd have to look at exactly what data we're talking about and what kind of uh, mapping or transformation would need to happen. 
Yeah, because that's the big one. Is ultimately the data needs to look in some way that it feels and can be uh, interpretable as an ALM data. But we do that already. There are right. a lot of different exactly. competitor tools we pull data in already from. So. Exactly, exactly. So if it's one of those, then yes, we might even have a solution in Box already. Um, otherwise, we might be looking at you know something custom if it's like a homegrown tool for example that would probably be something custom or you know our partners also have many um, adapters so technically yes absolutely possible the ins and outs of how we do it we'd have to look at the specific uh, data and and then give a more accurate information does that make sense it does. So, and the other question, I guess, it was around just uh, implementation here. Um, if we're doing the SaaS add-on, uh, do we know if there's any downtime required for the SaaS instance in order to turn on that algorithm? I I don't think there is. Like, it, it, they've um, already turned it on for some customers. I want to say, and I I could be wrong about this. Shell, maybe you remember specifically what Orin told us. I know it can. It's pretty quick. Uh, within a day, maybe faster. Shell, do you remember? No, I don't think there's any, don't think there's any downtime need, needed for it. It might take a couple of days till it's actually installed, but during that time you'll be able to carry on working as usual. Yeah, that makes sense, because we're, we're, again, we're annotating the data that's already in the system. We're not actually doing anything in the system itself. We're just you know reading instead of writing. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. I'm trying to think of anything else here that may be uh, worth asking here. Um, a lot of questions around next-gen ALM, which is interesting. <laughs> well, okay, great. I hope that people are getting excited about that, too. <laughs> uh, it is. And actually, again, so stay tuned. We're working on securing a date in March to be able to talk more about next-gen ALM. Um, even though it's next-gen ALM, I, you know, don't look for a big bang, you know, version 13 or version 14. Um, but it'll be fairly well communicated that it's a big deal. Um, now, again, not a new product. Next-gen ALM is not forcing you to buy new stuff. If you've got ALM or Quality Center Enterprise today, that's there, it's the logical upgrade pass. The predictive, and again, to clarify, the predictive defect convergence that Megan demoed today, that is available already today for Quality Center and ALM customers. You can get it on the HP Live Network or HPE Live Network. You do have to be logged in to the system to actually get it. Um, but in future, some of the new predictive capabilities we're looking to build that have not yet been built, those are likely going to be a separate offering that you can add on to uh, to your existing tool set. Correct. Oh, Matt, are there any other housekeeping points we need to make? I know we've only got like two, three minutes left. Um, anything about the survey, the follow-up, anything? Um, um, no, I think so. Yeah, okay, there you go. Uh, yes, sorry. Could I make could I make one comment because I do see that some people are having some trouble with the handout and or some of the links and I do want to just let everyone know the links were all tested and the handout does open if you're having trouble my guess is that you may have a blocker in your firewall that's not permitting you access so you might want to try it from a personal computer or away from your business um, well, or I can email you know, directly uh, the white paper and such if they need it. They can send a note to the Visit website. Right. The the white paper is available on the HP Live Network. There's another um, site where Matt posted it. So if you're unable to get the handout, there are several other ways we can get it to you. Yeah, actually, it's a worst case scenario if you're, you're stuck and you want to get the white paper. If you go to the uh, HP EALM, uh, main product landing page, one of the additional resources, actually the first additional resource, uh, will be that white paper. So there are a couple different things there. Um, I think that's it as far as some of the main questions. Again, we we could get into de uh, detail, we will actually, we'll answer a lot of these offline and then post some of those answers after the session is, is completed here. Um, I guess, uh, Megan, if you want to scroll to the very last slide. Sure. We'll just leave... Uh, There we go. Just the last little bit here. Um, so again, if you want, if you could just complete a, just a short survey, um, and if you again, if you have any questions or want to get more information, please reach out to us as well. But we'll be posting the actual presentation um, and again, the answered questions that we weren't able to do in this session here, um, mm -hmm. as well as some of the links on the Vivid site afterwards as normal. Right, and the recording will also be available. Terry, what did you tell us within like a day or two? Yes, they'll get a follow-up email to probably tomorrow, and the recording and the presentation will be at that link. Okay, great. Excellent. 
so I think at least at this point, I think we, we've, uh, we're, we're done from, for now, but we definitely appreciate everybody sitting in on the session here. Again, there'll be more stuff that we'll be talking about with NextGen ALM, as well as some of the new predictive stuff. So stay tuned for some of that stuff coming up in the near future. Uh, but again, we really appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, to sit in and, and listen and learn some stuff here with us this morning. Yes, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the great questions, and we yes. will answer all the ones we didn't have time for today. Um, I encourage you to go out and try out the tech preview and, and share your feedback with us. We're really excited about predictive ALM and the direction that we're going in, and you know we're so happy to have you on this journey with us. So thanks, and thanks for moderating, Matt. We're awesome. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. All right, guys. Have a great day. Okay. Thanks. Bye.